Coming up on this episode of Photography Online, we take a monster tour around Loch Ness, we discuss some of your questions and comments, and we take the challenge of portraiture to large format. Welcome to part two of this month's Photography Online, which is once again commercial free and coming to you from Europe's largest photo consumer exhibition at the NEC here in Birmingham. I'll be showing you a little more about that later, but let's get straight on with our first feature. Last year, we brought you a regular monthly series as we counted down the top 10 landscape views on the Isle of Skye. This year, we had planned to bring you more locations from a bit further afield, but for obvious reasons, we were unable to travel as much as we would have liked to. Not to be beaten though, we thought we would take a tour of one of the most infamous bodies of water on the planet. Strap yourselves in, we're off on our road trip. Loch Ness is one of the most famous bodies of water anywhere in the world. Historical stories, as well as numerous photos, all pointed towards the existence of a prehistoric creature living in the depths. The Loch Ness Monster, or Nessie to the locals, has since been proved to be a myth. But that doesn't stop hundreds of thousands of tourists per year visiting the area, some still hoping to get a glimpse of Nessie herself. Coming here to try and get a glimpse of a mythical monster may leave you a little disappointed, but there are many other reasons to visit the area, and one of the best is photography. I'm going to circumnavigate the UK's largest body of water to show you where you are most likely to find the best photo highlights. Unless you are reasonably local, it's probable that the gateway to Loch Ness will be via Inverness, the capital of the Scottish Highlands. With an international airport, sort of, a train link to most major cities in the UK, and easy road access to the north and south, the chances are that most Loch Ness adventures will start here. Before you leave the city, it's worth checking out a couple of local spots which can be great for photography. The first is right in the heart of the city itself, with the River Ness running right past the castle, and a number of picturesque bridges which provide good subjects in themselves, but also great vantage points to take photos from. Then for the wildlife enthusiasts, there's a location just 20 minutes north of the city where you can get as close as you are ever likely to get to wild dolphins. Shannery Point lies at the end of a peninsula which sticks out into the Moray Firth. On a rising tide, a local pod of resident dolphins feed on fish right next to the shoreline, sometimes jumping right out of the water as if to pose for the permanent troop of photographers. Being wild animals, you can't guarantee to see them, but if you are unlucky, you can at least console yourself with a shot of the lighthouse. Starting at the northeastern end of Loch Ness, I'm going to drive anti-clockwise, taking in the best views and exploring a diverse range of photo subjects along the way. After leaving Inverness on the A82, it's not long before you get your first view of the immense loch. Having already addressed the fictional side of Loch Ness, I thought I'd share a couple of facts about the place while I drive to our first photo stop. Now, if I call this body of water a lake, there will be lots of very unhappy Scots, as there is only one lake in the whole of Scotland. Lake of Menteith, in case it comes up in a pub quiz, so I need to be very careful here. Being the UK's largest body of water is clear to see simply by looking at a map. But to give you an idea of how big it is, there is a fact which perfectly illustrates its size. So here it is. There is more water in Loch Ness than in all the lakes and rivers in England and Wales combined. This is largely to do with its depth, 
which goes down to as much as 800 feet in some places. There's an estimated 263 billion cubic feet of fresh water inside there. That's enough space to fit every single person on the planet inside, 10 times over. The first obvious photo location to stop at is Urquhart Castle, which although only a ruin, provides a great focal point and subject with Loch Ness as the backdrop. This used to be free to walk around, but now it's managed by Historic Scotland, who charge for admission. However, you don't need to gain access to get some great shots, so it's probably not worth buying a ticket if you only want to take a photo. Continuing along the A82 heading southwest along the shore of Loch Ness reveals many open views. While there isn't one particular location which is obvious for photography, many have great potential if the light and sky are good. So keep a lookout on the left and park in one of the parking places if you see something worthy of stopping. The next good photo location can be found near the town of Invermoriston. This old stone bridge and surrounding woodland can be epic in the spring when the floor is often carpeted with bluebells, and again in the autumn when the trees add a dash of colour to this timeless scene. Before continuing on, it's worth mentioning that Ford's Photographic, Scotland's best photo store, is just a short drive away from here. So whether you've forgotten a vital piece of kit or just fancy visiting what's locally known as the toy shop, then it's just a 20 minute drive up that road there. A little further to the south and we reach the town of Fort Augustus, which also marks the foot of Loch Ness. Just before you reach Fort Augustus, you will come across these shipwrecks which, in the right conditions, could work really well for photography. Ideally, you'd want really calm conditions to be able to get a reflection on the water, but if not and you have got some texture, the use of a really heavy ND filter, like this 10-stop, could work really well to smooth out the water and create a really atmospheric effect which will work perfectly for these boats. Fort Augustus marks the point where we need to turn back towards Inverness, this time following the B862 along the southern shore of Loch Ness. Although already halfway around the loch in distance, the best photo locations are yet to come. The road which hugs the southern shore of Loch Ness feels very different to the one which we have just driven down on the opposite side. Firstly, it is much quieter, so stopping to take shots and reacting to transient light is far easier. But even the landscape is different. With open moorland and other smaller lochs dotted around the place, there is far more opportunity and incentive to stop more regularly along this return stage. So allow more time for this leg. Even the road itself can be photogenic. A little further on sees the landscape change again, this time into dense spruce forests. Soon you'll reach the tiny village of Foyers, where there is a waterfall, which in the right conditions is certainly worth the 10 minute stroll to get to. Sadly, the right conditions didn't exist for my visit, but you can use your imagination to get a sense of what this could be like when it's in full flow. The most direct road between here and Inverness is called General Wade's Military Road, which sounds far more interesting and exciting than its official name, the B852. Don't be afraid to go exploring down some of the smaller roads off to the right which lead deeper into the spruce forest. 
Again, there is no set location here, but just going for a random wander in this area is bound to turn up some pleasant options for photography. Continuing along General Wade's military road, the views of Loch Ness dominate to the left, and it's not long before we can see our first location, Urquhart Castle across the water. The final village is Dawes, after which the road veers away from Loch Ness and is simply a case of driving for another 20 minutes or so before arriving back at our starting point in Inverness. If you end up staying the night here, then it's worth heading back out along the banks of the River Ness at dusk to see the castle and bridges all lit up. I'm not staying the night as I live over on Skye, which is just a couple of hours in the west, so that's where I'm going to head off to now but I hope I've been able to show you that the main attraction of Loch Ness is its location and surroundings, and not a big monster which you're very unlikely to see. But if you're like me, I bet you can't resist having a look. to be able to bring you some amazing overseas locations next year so make sure you're subscribed to our channel and activate notifications so that you get a gentle nudge every time we release a new show okay so if you were watching part one of this month's show you'll have seen me revealing some of the highlights from this year's biggest consumer photography show aptly named the photography show I learned all about Ilford's new pop-up darkroom, which will be in the shop soon. Harry chatted to Olympus to hear about the future of their brand and to try their latest gear. And I hang out in the analog spotlight arena, where there were also some exciting new developments. Now, every month we get a whole host of questions and comments from you guys, either through our website or in the comments section here on YouTube. The vast majority of these are positive, but there's always somebody that we seem to upset every show. But we love hearing from you guys, whatever your reason for reaching out. We do read all the comments and try to reply to as many as we can, but we often feel that when we answer specific questions, it's a bit of a waste when only one or two people are ever going to see the answer. So, after the show last night, I decided to put some of your questions to the guys. All right, guys, so I've got a list of questions here from some of our viewers, which I want to kind of just go over with some of you. So I'm going to go through these uh, one at a time. First up, one of the questions that we get asked quite a lot, I think, James, I'll go to you with this one, is what have you got against Sony and why are you so Canon biased? Oh, that's it. I have absolutely nothing against Sony. Absolutely nothing at all. And I'm not Canon biased. I'm just a Canon user. That's all. I have nothing more to say on the matter. Same for the rest of you guys? Well, yeah, it is a comment we get asked a lot and I think what people assume is that when we're doing a feature about, say, a camera technique, depth of field, focusing, composition, we use our own gear and we happen to use Canon cameras. So uh, people see us using Canons a lot, but when we're doing a feature about a piece of equipment, then we very rarely do a feature about a Canon piece of equipment. It's normally you know, Fuji, Olympus, help me out here. Sony, Sony, Sony. Sony. <laughs> there we go, this one we forgot. If you'd asked me that question in the early 90s, I'd have said I was a Nikon guy. So no bias, just we're using our own nope, kit I've and changed that, that's just then. what it is. If, 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 if Sony ago. wants to send us cameras, yep. we'll have I'll change again, them. change again. Yep. Fantastic, all right, well, question number two. Marcus, this is one for you. What's the weird tripod head which I often see you using? We get asked this a lot. All the time. Um, so the the actual model number, it's a Manfrotto um, tripod head and the model number is 322RC2 and the only reason Memorable. I... I know, the only reason I know that is because I get asked it so often. Um, they don't make them anymore. Um, they, there is a, a replacement model but it's not as good so um, you can still get them used. Um, and it's, I just find it really useful because with one hand, you just move it around and then wherever you let go, it's locked solid. Some people don't like them, but a lot of people uh, ask okay. them about Okay, Manfrotto it. R22? 322 RC2. 322RC2, we'll start putting it in the links, I think it's probably the easiest one for that. Brilliant. All right, another one for you, Marcus, actually, and this again, one we get asked fairly regularly, uh, yeah, it's all about you, I know. We'll, we'll get to the rest of you guys. Uh, what did, uh, sorry, whatever happened to the moon and the tree shot? This is the one we did yeah. kind of way back in the day. Is that still ongoing, that project? Uh, absolutely, but the problem is, I mean, we explained this when we set out on the feature, is that you only get two or three opportunities per year 
to get that shot. This is Mission Possible. This is yeah, one of our so, early Mission Possibles. Yeah, so if you watch a um, previous show, you'll see us that we've got, uh, the idea is, is that the moon rises behind a tree. Um, but we need to be in location before we see the moon. So you can't see the moon and then go oh, quick left to the right because by then you've missed it. So you get three opportunities, maybe two a, a year. Um, and we've been trying for what, two years now? Just about, yeah. And every time we've tried, it's either been cloudy or we've been in lockdown. There's always something that's prevented us from going there. So um, the next opportunity will be in a couple of months. So watch this space. All right, fantastic. Uh, James, one for you. This is from William Arthur. He's asking, do memory cards wear out and does the quality of the card affect the quality of the image? Quality of the card definitely does not affect the quality of the image. So that's nice and clear. And do they wear out? It's a very difficult question to answer, but the simple rule is don't delete individual images off your card. So if you review an image on the back of the camera and you don't like it, leave it. Back up all your photos when you get back to base, wherever it is you are, and then format. Always reformat your card each time. And then they should last a lifetime. Basic card maintenance. Yep. Harry, one for you. This is... Uh, <laughs> what did you think of Marcus's impression of you on a recent show? What, what impression? Well, that's what I was wondering when they asked. I was there. Was there, was there... Exactly, it was Harry. Yeah. It, was, it was so good that people... Uh, I, st people I still got the there. wig at home. <laughs> I shan't ask you what you use that for. All right, uh, this is from Chaz. Uh, another one for you, Harry, I think. <laughs> no criticism here. Surprised you promoted drinking alcohol as it causes dehydration, impairs judgment and coordination and makes acclimatizing to altitude harder. Yeah. I think he's yeah. referring to your just the two of us when you were climbing uh, the mountain That's right. to yeah. show you were at that high altitude. Yeah, yeah. well, it, it, I was about 100 meters above sea level, so the altitude wasn't, wasn't a problem. Uh, and uh, I also had water. So I wasn't too dehydrated. What do you take with you? What's your tipple of choice? I uh, definitely will. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't be so irresponsible. Sparkling to take... or still? Sparkling. Sparkling. <laughs> definitely sparkling. Yeah. Another one for you, Harry. Not to get on at you or anything, but uh, I often see you climbing over gates and fences. Are you trespassing? Not in Scotland. In England, very much so. But in Scotland, we've got the right to roam uh, where you can open the gates. Uh, but if they're padlocked, then as long as you're not damaging fences and property, then you're free to proceed as you want, basically. Okay, uh, Marcus, another one for you. I enjoyed the lens movement feature with a large format camera, but I wondered if similar control of focus can be achieved with a tilt shift lens on a digital camera. Yep, absolutely it can. Um, so in that feature, you saw me um, tilting the lens forward like that. That can be done on a tilt shift lens, but I also uh, applied a bit of a swing as well. Now, again, this is gonna sound like we're pro Canon. On a Canon tilt shift lens, you can do those two together because okay. the two, um, the, the left and right and the up and down work independently of each other. I believe um, on a Nikon, you can't because they don't work independently. They're, they're fixed at 90 degrees to each other. Um, so the answer is yes, you can do it, providing you've got the right lens and the right brand. But in theory, you can do it on, on a Are you going camera. to do it? Are you going to demonstrate? Would you like me to send a 17 tilt shift? If you, if you want to, you can. Because you sold yours, didn't you? Uh, I never had one, actually. I had a 24. Did you not? <laughs> so. All right, last couple of questions. Uh, James, I see you changing lenses all the time outdoors. Isn't this dangerous to the camera? Uh, not, oh, people are going to go back and check now, aren't they? Which way up I was holding the body when I was... If you hold the, if you disconnect the lens, Sort of with the, the body down. With, yeah, yeah, facing down, then no, it wouldn't make any difference. Doing it. it is different in Scotland where you have midges. So there are times when you need to take. So we, we've been out in the old days shooting film, and I can remember real, real problems with getting midges in the back of uh, I've cameras. I've it opened up a camera yeah. at home, so and it midges is, have come out. It is wow. a serious, serious question, yeah. And it can cause real damage as well if they get behind the shutter and in mirrorless as well. To elaborate on that, I think a lot of people are under the impression that you shouldn't change a lens outdoors, but you can change it perfectly okay when you're indoors. But it's completely the opposite way around. That the air, there's a lot more dust in the air indoors mm -hmm. than there is outdoors. So um, don't be one of those people that think it's changing, okay to change it indoors because you're doing it the wrong way around. If anything, you want to be changing it outdoors. As long as you're not in the middle of a desert or um, it's not a really hazy day with a high pollen count or something. Oh, or midges, yeah. Absolutely. All right, well, final question, and either Harry or Marcus can take this one. It's easy for you to take photos because of where you are based. There's nothing to take photos of where I live, and that's a comment we've seen. Whoa. Well, OK, no, no, so, no, 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 no. so I, I, I'll, I'll fill this in. I grew up uh, on the, the River Thames 
in Essex, and you would, would have said that. I mean, it was a pretty boring place to, to grow up. In a shack. In a shack. But I, I still had stuff that was close to me. I was interested primarily in wildlife, and there are nature reserves, and they're scattered all across the country. So, yes, it's not otters and it's not eagles and it might not be super exciting to everyone but it was still something to practice on it was still something to, to hone on and for me i enjoyed that just as much and it's something to go out and shoot every day that's what's going to help it's you. often more accessible very much so and that's what's going to help you get better i think the thing to do is to try to look for subjects which are already in your local area so if you live in the midlands of the uk and you want to do mountain photography, you're going to get disappointed yeah. because there are no mountains. But if you go out and do street photography or you go out and do, what's, what wildlife would you find in the Midlands? <laughs> Just about anything, to be honest. Well, the well, Midlands will be full of roe deer. Yeah, It'll be exactly. full of muntjac deer. It's very well, well known for its muntjac deer. Definitely get those all across and they will come right into almost to the centre of Birmingham where we are right now. But even if you live in a really, um, a kind of like a run down area, that you think is completely not photogenic, use it to your advantage. So, like so the NEC. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so use what you think is, uh, is the hindrance to your advantage and turn it around and, and do a project on, you know, why is your area like that? And, and photograph the people and the characters that live there. Um, it's not mountain photography, but... It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be, absolutely. So um, I think that comment is coming from somebody who lives uh, in l a very boring landscape environment and they see us in a very interesting and they Absolutely. only want to shoot landscapes. Yeah. But there'll be plenty of other things that they can shoot which we can't shoot. Yeah. So you could turn the tables around. Fantastic, well that's, that's all the questions I have. I know there's loads more in the comments and stuff. Feel free to keep leaving them in there. Maybe we'll do it again next yeah, year. Absolutely, yeah. When we're down in Birmingham. Brilliant, thanks guys. Thank you. So a big thank you to everybody for all your questions and comments and do feel free to keep those coming in. Just before we head back to the NEC, I wanted to remind you as well about Scotland's photo of the year. The deadline is fast approaching. It's the 31st of October. So if you've got any photographs of Scotland, not forgetting as well, they don't have to be landscapes. It can be wildlife, urban stuff, street, whatever you like. Just head over to scotland.photography. You can get all the information you need on there and you can enter as well. And you can check out the prize fund, which is almost £6,000 pounds which is fantastic plus don't forget that all profits go to local charity so it's a really really good one to get involved with all right well let's head back over to the NEC so as you know we are here at the photography show where we have our own stand and the main purpose for this is to market some of our workshops and photo holidays which we run on a regular basis as well as the one-to-one -one services that we provide on Sky, the Isle of Man and in the southwest of England. But on top of that we also have a few of our branded goodies on sale and we've designed a couple of new t-shirts which we've unveiled here as modelled by Harry. This is the first one and then more appropriate for Marcus this is the second one and these are now available through our online shop so if you fancy getting your hands on these limited edition tees there's a link in the usual place so moving on last month we saw mark is explaining all about lens movements on his large format camera and many of you got in touch to say how interesting it was and requested more large format features marcus doesn't need much of an excuse to get out with it so he was delighted when given permission to film another feature this time he's trying out a brand new piece of equipment which connects the traditional method of large format photography with the instant convenience of the modern world world. Every now and again something new on the photography scene comes along which gets me quite excited and this happened recently with this product here. It's the Lomography Graphlock 4x5. What it essentially is, is uh, an instant film back for a 4x5 camera. It comes in two parts. This here is the mask because the film that this takes uh, is that size there. It's the Fuji Instax 300 wide, um, which isn't quite as big as a 4x5, but it's close enough. So um, you get this extra mask as well. So that's your that area there is your 4x5 and you can see that the window there it's you know 80% of the frame so you have to recompose a little bit and also because when this fits in the film is quite far back into the uh, holder here 
So this is also a spacer, it acts as a spacer as well. So when you insert this behind your ground glass screen, it pushes the ground glass back, um, which is good if you want to do close-up work because it basically gives you another centimetre of bellows extension. Um, and then you do your focusing, you do your composition, you then remove that. And if you've got a, a focusing screen that comes out far enough, you could just slot that in there, but this one won't do that. So it's then just a case of removing uh, the focus screen and dropping this in. And this is a, a graph lock system, which I'm told 90% of 4x5 cameras are compatible with. Um, and that's now good to go. So we've got our model Lexi, who's with us today. Um, she's going to be doing some ballet poses in the uh, woods here. And what this back's going to do is it's going to allow us to A, test the exposure um, because we're going to have quite a bit of bellows extension going on here. Um, and secondly, it allows us to check composition. Okay, right, when you're ready, so you just need to try and hold as still as you can. Don't worry, I'll take the photo when I think you're still enough. So you just uh, show me what you're going to do first. Okay, right, so are you able to hold that for a second when you go into the, into like the full pose? I'm just trying to think whether you want to be looking at the camera or not. Yeah, you probably don't. Uh, just go forward that way a little bit. Tiny bit more, that's it, there we go. Uh, right, pull the dark side out. Shutter's cocked, everything's good to go. All right, off you go then. Okay, got it. Right, if you put your coat on, Lexi, just so you don't get cold. Okay, this is the exciting bit. So I'm just gonna press the button and out comes the photo. In a minute, something will appear on there. You know, uh, when you see everybody shaking them. Yeah, you're not supposed to do that apparently. So. Yeah, the exposure is probably all right on that one because it's, you see, but you see how it's picking the, the light up on your face. That doesn't happen when you, unless you look up like that. That's quite nice. That'll be a nice photo when it's on uh, film. So it's dead easy to use. There's only two buttons on it. First one turns it on. Um, and you can only remove the dark slide when it's turned on. When it's turned off, um, if I can turn it off there, the dark slide's now locked. So you have to turn it on in order to remove the dark slide. Um, a little light comes on there just to show that um, it is on. Um, and the only other button is the film eject button. So once you've taken the shot, you then just press this button here and it ejects the, the film. Um, and then it takes two to three minutes to expose. Although I found that you don't get proper contrast until maybe five or 10 minutes later. Uh, but you get a good idea as to what the exposure is gonna be after two or three minutes. So with the instant photos to use as a reference, we could now take the shot on standard film, in this case, Ilford HP5+. We decided that this pose had the best potential, but I'm going to increase the exposure slightly, although I do want the image quite dark. Just try and hold it for as long as you can when you're up there. Yep, perfect. This is the final film print, which was done by Robin Bell, the master printer we featured in a show a couple of months ago. I'm reasonably happy with it, but there are always ways to improve things. But the purpose of this shot was to give it to Lexi, so her reaction will be the true indicator as to its success. Hello. Hi. Got a photo for you. And you have to give me your honest opinion. Okay. <laughs> so I just want you to look at it from a point of view of a photo of you. Don't worry about the technical side of it as a photo. But there we go. <gasps> oh my gosh. Did it you like it? It looks so good. Thank goodness we practiced it a few times. Well, this is the thing. This is what that uh, film, the instant film back 
yeah. helped us do is it helped us take the photo and get things right and then we only had to take one shot to get and it then, actually and then, good now, yeah. this isn't technically perfect and if i could do it again i could get it better but you won't notice the difference yeah, and, not at all. and all it is is can you see your feet mm -hmm. are slightly out of focus but yeah, as it comes up it. as it comes up to your face and your hands particularly then then they're in focus because the plane of focus wasn't at the right angle but i had too much to think about <laughs> But the good thing about this photo is that it's never been in a digital form. So we took it on film and then the film, the negative was shone onto this paper through an enlarger. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a proper photo. So it's never been in a digital form. So there's no Photoshop yeah. or anything like that. It is what it is. It's just exactly how the camera picked, um, it, up. picked it up. So, so you like it, so dear. cool, yeah. Okay, there's a relief. <laughs> but if, you, if, you, if we had to do it again, mm -hmm. would you change anything? No, I think it looks really good. I think the how we did it, because the first position, like the first pose that we did was like it you was... You were arching round. Yeah, yeah arching round. It doesn't suit the, with the trees, no, does it? No, it looks so, like it looks so much better. And mm -hmm. it just sort of, I feel like it fits the page better. Cause it, not the page, but like the picture better. Because yeah, yeah. it's sort of in the middle and it's just like... Okay, that's good. And then do you remember we did another one? We did a close up one, didn't oh, we? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, so this is a colour one. So this has this this has been digitised because um, but that's your, oh your close-up one. So that has been <laughs> cleaned up a little bit in Photoshop. But it's like so zoomed in. Um, look at my eyes. They're I know. So well, that's like... the thing about that camera is that your eyes are, in, are perfectly sharp. Yeah. But even your eyebrows, mm -hmm. which are only what like half a centimetre in front of your eyes, are already out of focus. So that's why it was so critical. Yeah. You to look keep at your still. ears. Look, look how out of focus your ears are. So if you'd moved even just one or two millimetres between me focusing and taking the photo, then it would have uh, would have messed it all up. It looked really good though. Yeah. So, so there you go. Cool. We, only, we only took two photos, and they're both winners. So that's good. <laughs> Gonna have to frame these now, Mum. No excuse. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that's the kind of photography I could see myself getting totally immersed in. And what a result! Surely not achievable with anything other than large format. Thanks to Lomography for sending us the instant film back. Apparently that's the first one in the UK. And also thank you to Forrest Photographic for the extended loan of the camera. I'm pretty sure Mark is now considered he's got squatter's rights to it, so I'm not sure they're going to be getting that back anytime soon. And thanks also to Lexi, our wonderful model, who is clearly the true star of the photo. All right, well, we are out of time again, but fear not, we're back in just a couple of weeks, so you don't need to wait too long for your next Photography Online fix. Until then, take good care, but most of all, take good photos. <laughs>